and welcome. I am your host, Lauren Gates, and of this evening's Airway Health Solutions Conversations with two industry leaders in pediatric sleep disordered breathing, Dr. Kevin Boyd and Dr. Ben Moralia. Welcome, Dr. Boyd, and welcome back, Dr. Moralia. I am thrilled to have you both here to discuss a very important and timely topic, pediatric sleep disordered breathing. So welcome, and let's kind of roll up our sleeves and, and dive right in. <laughs> we have over 300 healthcare professionals registered this evening. So that's amazing. That just shows you right then and there how interested everybody is um, in our audience and basically around the world. So I would like to introduce um, Dr. Kevin Boyd. I'm gonna give a formal introduction. Is that okay with you, Dr. Boyd? Please. Okay, here we go. Dr. Boyd is a board, board certified pediatric dentist practicing in Chicago. He is also an attending instructor in the residency training program in pediatric dentistry at Lurie Children's Hospital, where he additionally serves as a dental consultant to the sleep medicine service. Prior to completing his dental degree from Loyola University Chicago College of Dentistry in 1986, he obtained an advanced degree in human nutrition from Michigan State University, where his research interests were focused on unhealthy eating, dental caries, obesity, and diabetes. Dr. Boyd attended the University of Iowa for his postgraduate residency training, where he received a certificate in pediatric dentistry in 1988. And Dr. Boyd has served on the teaching faculties of the University of Illinois College of Dentistry, the University of Michigan's College of Dentistry, the University of Chicago Hospital, Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's Medical Center, and Michael Reese Hospital as an attending clinical instructor. His clinical focus is centered upon prevention of oral and systemic disease through promotion of healthy breathing and eating. His primary research interest is in the area of infant early childhood feeding practices and how they impact palatal facial development, nasorespiratory competence, and neurocognitive development. He is currently a visiting scholar at University of Pennsylvania doing research in the areas of anthropology and orthodontics. He has recently appointed as an adjunct assistant professional in the Department of Anthropology at the University of Arkansas. So welcome, Dr. Boyd, and I'm just going to go ahead and give Dr. Ben Moralia um, an intro. I know everyone knows Dr. Moralia, so it won't be as lengthy uh, just to save some time. Uh, but Dr. Moralia graduated from the SUNY at Buffalo School of Dental Medicine. He has 26 years of general practice experience in Mount Kisco, New York, including 17 years of interceptive orthodontic experience, where his focus has been on early childhood growth and development. Dr. Moralia lectures nationally on sleep disorder breathing, clear line of therapy, and craniofacial development. He is on the board of directors of the American Academy of Physiological Medicine and Dentistry and is on the President's Council of Northern Westchester Hospital in Mount Kisco, New York. Dr. Moralia has been recognized multiple times as a leader in continuing education by Dentistry Magazine today, excuse me, by Dentistry Today Magazine. And just a quick medical disclaimer, so then we can jump right into this juicy topic here. Uh, the content presented is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with any questions you may have regarding a medical or dental condition. Okay, so we are all set. Welcome, and um, let's get rolling. Let's talk a little bit of um, let's talk a little bit about how Dr. Boyd you met Dr. Moralia and how you know you came to be here at Air Airway Health Solutions. Um, but 10 years ago, maybe, uh, uh, AAPMD meeting, Ben gave a great presentation on his work with uh, Mile Brace, I think it was, and showed results. Uh, how when you get in early, you can make some changes without being real invasive. Um, and then he had similar interests to me in that not only what is the origin of malocclusion in a child that's, you know, living and breathing today, but our ancestors. Ben has always been interested in evolutionary significance of uh, how come there was no malocclusion until fairly recently. And so he and I have come upon that curiosity independently. And uh, I think it just made sense at some point that he and I get on the same venue and uh, you've really uh, helped facilitate facilitate that Lauren and um, this is our this is our 
debut. This is our, uh, I don't know. It's the beginning of a beautiful relationship. That's what yeah. I think. <laughs> yeah, that's wonderful. And that's, yeah, that's amazing. But just to add a little to it is that, yeah, doc, Dr. Boyd is one of the early mentors for me. And so um, he's been at this a lot longer and with even much better results and success. And uh, early on, one of definitely the most positive influences on me to keep heading in the direction I was heading. So it's, it's a total honor to be on the same screen as you right now. I appreciate you coming on. Thank you. Uh, likewise, Ben. This has been really looking forward to this day. It had to happen. So, Terrific. So, well, we're all looking forward to it. So let's get let's get to it. Dr. Boyd, do you want to share your screen? And let's um, just talk about, you know, what, what you want to share with us tonight for about 15, 20 minutes. And then we'll have a panel discussion. And I have uh, plenty of questions to get us through the remainder of, of the evening. Okay, so who's that beetle, Lauren, again? John Lennon, you got it. Hopefully, I'd like to say thanks on behalf of the group and I hope we will pass the audition. Uh, <laughs> that's what he said after the roof, rooftop concert. So I'm gonna play a little video here for about a minute and a half. So listen up, this is important. When I'm 80 years old. When I'm 90, hopefully when I'm 100 years, years old. Uh, be able to interact with things I always worry about is, is being dependent on somebody. Health continue to be engaged and productive. Hope to become an old, young, active person. Over the course of human history, most people died before the age of 10, with an exceptional few living into their 60s and 70s. Around 150 years ago, a remarkable shift occurred, and the average length of life began to increase. Every decade, about two years were added to average life expectancy. This trend continued in Western Europe and North America until by the close of the 20th century, life expectancy had doubled for most people in the developed world. In those additional 30 years of life that we added in the 20th century, we call the first longevity revolution. It was primarily improvements in public health, like clean water, uh, sanitation, indoor living and working environments, controlled uh, air temperature. These are all the things that created very harsh conditions for people in the early part of the 20th century. We wanted to live longer. We didn't want our children to die. We succeeded in doing this. Uh, and we got exactly what we, what we wished for. Today, the numbers of people living to old age and to super old age are rising around the globe. To live a long life is a monumental achievement, and longer lifespans are precious gifts for everyone. But there is another side to this story. 50% of the children born now will live naturally to over 100 years. But if we don't increase health span, what it means is that individuals are gonna still succumb to cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and neurodegenerative disease at some point between their 40s and their 70s. So if you've not heard of that concept of health span, it makes sense, it's logical. Lifespan is you know, expectant life uh, length from birth and it's going up even with the pandemic and adjusting for the AIDS crisis and things. Kids will live to be 100, uh, their lifespan will be, but what about their health span? You know, health span is how long will they stay healthy into old age? Ideally, it would be that if lifespan reaches 89, health span reaches 87 or 88, you got a year of crappy health or you, you know you die quickly. But staying healthy into old age is predicated on being very healthy in early age. It used to be that um, if you had malocclusion, if you had uh, you know, transverse deficiency of, of your maxilla and, and of course mandible because the, the mandible grows within the maxilla. If you had that in early childhood prior to fairly recently, you were dead. You couldn't survive childhood because it meant that you were not breastfed according to an ancestral pattern, which is on demand for the first six to eight months of life and then continued on demand during a weaning period of up to three years. Okay, so, and, and even then you, all, you didn't live, a lot of kids didn't survive childhood, but that was an absolute necessity. Nobody survived childhood unless they had a perfect occlusion uh, in the first four years of life. Go figure, and I can, that's medically defensible. Uh, 
and I'm not going to have time to develop that argument tonight. So look at the, the uh, malocclusion, um, the, the prevalence of it, and it will persist. If it's in the deciduous dentition, meaning transverse or sagittal, retronathia, class two, if you have either of those two phenotypes as a young child, no space between the baby teeth, a high narrow palate, maybe a crossbite, but not necessarily, um, then guess what? It's going to persist. It's going to worsen. And it either is already or will become a comorbidity with sleep-related breathing disorders. You can take that to the bank. It's true. And now with the American Heart Association, what they have come out with is that a kid who has apnea in childhood, if it's not corrected, they have a very high chance of developing hypertension and other cardi cardiovascular comorbidities. So um, <clears throat> I'm not gonna uh, develop this too much, but what I'm gonna show is a protocol that we have developed. We got an IRB for it at Children's Memorial Hospital, and I'll call Lurie, uh, with Stephen Sheldon, who's head of sleep medicine. And we were looking at children who presented with comorbidity of uh, sleep disordered breathing, not necessarily full-blown apnea, and malocclusion. And we, our protocol said that we would resolve the malocclusion to the best of our ability by doing no retraction. We called it non-retractive orthodontics. Um, that was 12 years ago that IRB has run out, but we've since in my practice seen perhaps 100,000, maybe over a thousand patients now. We've uh, collected 50 that started treatment before the age of six. And we say that uh, we, we define early childhood malocclusion as before the age of six, just like pediatric dentists define, and everybody now, it's in the ICD-10, International Classification of Disease, is that early childhood, early childhood caries is any decay before the age of 72 months old. So we say malocclusion before the age of six, or 71 or 72 months old, that is early childhood malocclusion that will reliably persist beyond, usually worsen and either are or will become comorbidity with sleep. You know, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but I would like this to roll off of everybody's tongue because it's true. When you do transverse expansion alone in these kids, you can not only widen the nasal cavity, which shares a wall with the roof of the mouth, and that makes sense to everybody. You decrease nasal resistance when you expand transversely. There's loads of research on this. No prospective randomized trials, big deal. Uh, prospective randomized trials are the strongest, most robust form of evidence, but also the least available. And it wasn't ever available until after World War II. Lots of innovations have been made by observational studies. The public health people have known about this for decades. Is it observational trials like, how about vitamin C? That wasn't too bad, right? How about E equals NC squared? How about the elimination and identification of cholera uh, as, as being a waterborne disease and not an airborne disease? These were all observational studies that, that absolutely changed mankind. So when you expand a kid just in the transverse direction, even without a crossbite, you not only widen the nasal cavity, you increase the sagittal depth of the nasopharynx. And that's what this study is here, is that, and I will show some results of how that happens. Who would think by just doing something in the transverse dimension that you could affect uh, therapy in the sagittal dimension, anterior, posterior? You actually widen the distance between where the adenoids are, whether you have adenoids or not, in the anterior wall of the nasopharynx, which is the soft palate. McNamara discovered this and, and didn't realize the airway significance of it almost 40 years ago. There's since been others, mainly Maria Piavila from Italy, uh, who has, she's a pediatrician who's done more orthodontic dental facial orthopedic uh, studies than most orthodontists and, and dentists who do ortho. Um, then again, look at this, 1926, is that nearly all malocclusions, meaning transverse and sagittal discrepancies, begin in the deciduous dentures. They call class two distal occlusion, actually uh, angle 
developed that uh, in the 1800s. Um, and preventive orthodontics should be a concern of physicians, parents, and particularly dentists. But you know, this needs to be a collaborative partnership between dentists, physicians, myofunctional therapists, allergists, otolaryngologists. Um, and I, again, I won't have much to talk about there, but when you want to make a referral to an allied health professional, please go through the pediatrician. This is how you let pediatricians know that you do more than straighten, that you do more than straighten their teeth or fill cavities. And it's just a professional thing to do. Who's an allergist or an ENT that you like? Do you agree? Should this kid get an ENT referral? Um, these are things that we teach in a course. Dr. Logmani is a pediatric sleep physician um, and we are going to uh, give it a workshop on, on Dr. Moralia's uh, platform in the future. Uh, but you know, these are things that just please, if you see big adenoids, don't try to find an otolaryngologist for a child anyway. Call the pediatrician and work together. It's amazing the collaborations I have with pediatric health care um, physicians. Um, when do these things first show up? Okay, and we call that ontogeny. Um, and are they showing up in utero? Uh, ontogeny just means from conception to death, cradle to grave. Um, and we're proposing a study at Tufts with one of the orthodontic residents now to suggest that a mid gestational ultrasound at 20 weeks that shows retronathia is going to reliably predict that it will persist postnatally. We don't know that, it's a hypothesis. It's an informed hypothesis. Um, I'll keep you posted. This is a child, um, a mom, new patient was in yesterday and she sent me this. Dr. Christian Gimeno sort of discovered me. He called me out as being the only dentist he knew that cared about this particular angle right here. It's called the inferior facial angle. And if it's under 31 degrees, that means that that child absolutely has a syndrome. Pathognomonic for Pierre Robin, Cruzans, Treacher Collins, uh, Cleft Palate. So this angle right here, we like it to be between 68 and 72 degrees. And when Gimeno talked about this at a symposium in Chicago four or five years ago, I stood up to take a picture and he goes, Dr. Kevin Boyd, and I thought he's gonna throw me out of the meeting because I'm taking this picture and went on to say that I was the only person he understood that knows and is curious about this. And he sent me two French studies in French, I don't speak it, but I saw the diagrams that actually um, they were talking about this in the 1970s, um, more later, but uh, this is something to pay attention to. This is from McNamara. Jim McNamara, who really is now starting to turn his attention. He was one of my mentors. Um, I taught at Michigan for a while. He didn't really influence me there because that was after dental, uh, my pedo residency. But we used to go to the Moyers Girls Symposium from the University of Iowa for years, we did that. And McNamara always talked about the importance of early treatment. But this is incredible, is that he felt that uh, in, in this paper from 2015, that rapid expansion can absolutely, in, in whether or not it has a crossbite or not, um, can lead to disorders that, that can actually affect uh, systemic health. Uh, more later on him, but he's, he's influenced me a lot. Now I'm, I'm starting to see him really pay attention to airway. Um, I feel at two and a half years old, and I got a, a paper from JAMA, 1922, that says the ideal age to start expanding for um, what they say growing the deciduous arch is 20, uh, 30 months of age, two and a half. That's when there's 20 teeth. And um, I've talked to Ben uh, that I use a lot of, you know, myobrace and I've seen some of Ben's results and they're, they're in, really impressive. But I use myobrace and myomunches and things like that to desensitize a child until they are biologically and emotionally ready to start expansion, transverse expansion. Sometimes I will put reverse pole headgear, even if they don't have class three underbites, to just really exaggerate the sagittal dimension so you have more anterior tongue space. And I have a team of professionals. My team leader, uh, Orla, who's on the call, she's our office manager. 
she understands the protocol. She can explain it to people. Um, we don't charge our full fee. We, we only charge half our fee when we start before the age of five. And then we bill out the rest of it when the incisors come in and the six year molars. That's something I don't want to talk about, but that can be an obstacle. You're going to keep my kid in treatment from two and a half to eight and a half. Are you kidding? No, I don't. We do a little heavy lifting early in treatment. And then we just, we call it uh, uh, active retention. And we just observe them three or four times a year until they have, you know, all the eight incisors in and all the four, six year molars. So again, we start this real young and we have great success with it. So this is the talk I gave at my AHS, uh, the Ancestral Health Society, similar to Ben's. Um, this just came out from the American Dental Association, uh, an endorsement of a, a it's, it's actually a policy. Uh, I got five more minutes. So I'm just going to buzz through this. Okay, take uh, your time. Health span and lifespan. We, our proposal is that if we can get kids sleeping and breathing better really early in life, we are not only going to help them increase their lifespan, but we're going to help them stay healthier longer uh, by, by, you know, preventing these comorbidities early in childhood. So again, really what it is, is these are things that, you know, look what, what these things don't come in till much later in life. And this can increase it, you know, that this is a health, higher health span, but pulmonary disease comes in at 45, you know, this is going to decrease this person's lifespan and the, the amount of life they have left is going to be crappy. So we got to start paying attention to these kids, not just overweight. That's an important one, healthy eating, healthy activity, but healthy sleep and breathing. And that's why I'm suggesting I'm glad, you know, the American Orthodontic Society says, oh, let's see them by age seven, but not treat them until they're 11 or 12. That is, that is, that is medically indefensible from my perspective. Uh, that these kids need to be identified early at risk. Um, infant oral health, that's what pediatric dentists do by age one. We want to see every kid, not just to look for anomalies and tooth decay and gum disease, but also um, tethered oral tissues, you know, upper lip ties, lower lip ties, lower tongue ties. Um, and we're also looking for airway competence. The pediatric sleep questionnaire is a validated questionnaire. We're developing a new one at the ADA to, to complement what Ron Shervin did in the early 2000s at the University of Michigan with the Pediatric Sleep Questionnaire. Validated questions that correlate with malocclusion. It doesn't mean malocclusion is a risk factor, even though they'll probably prove it to be by every definition. We call it a comorbidity. And that's really all you should do is transverse deficiency and sagittal deficiencies or hypoplasias they are comorbidities often with sleep and breathing problems. If nothing else, you try, you do your best to start resolving that malocclusion early in life. You don't promise, I'm gonna get them into Harvard. They're not gonna have ADD. You know, you, you, that's out of your scope of practice. You're a dentist, you're gonna, you're gonna fix the malocclusion and you're gonna do it at least before the age of seven years old. Um, I'm talking with Ben on how I want our protocol to be incorporated with what he's doing in terms of just doing what you're doing, but do it earlier. Uh, so this is what we want to happen to lifespan and uh, lifespan and health span. We want them both to increase. So more later on that. This is really kind of typical of what we see. And it's like, well, you know, that kid from eight to 10 got taller, right? So doesn't it make sense that that airway would have grown anyway? Um, how about no? The craniofacial respiratory complex, new term, does not grow the same way long bones do. Somatic growth is way different from craniofacial respiratory growth. So we need to optimize structure and then function to go along with it. And that's myofunctional therapy, that's releases of tethered tissues, and that is development of the dental arches and face. The face is the front of the airway. The, 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 the front of the airway is the face. The back of the, the, back of the face is the airway. And I, I've got some diagrams of what the craniofacial respiratory uh, complex looks like. This just came out, cranio, uh, cranio respiratory, cardiorespiratory fitness. This is a index of 
um, oxygen utilization by skeletal muscle in kids for, for exercise. American kids are amongst the most overweight in the world and they have the worst cardiac fitness. Nothing was mentioned about sleep, apnea, malocclusion, any of that. So this is something where we have to assert ourselves with our medical colleagues who are dealing with these children. Um, and then this just came out. Pediatric sleep apnea, if it's not resolved, uh, and, and again, not just as, apnea, is, apnea is the end stage. Sleep disorder breathing is pre-apnea, okay? And pre-hypertension, and then hypertension. These kids are gonna suffer well into their adult years. Their lifespans will be affected by it, so are their health spans. We are in such a good position to make a difference for these children. Um, these are just some of the traits that everybody can see. I don't diagnose adenotonsillar hypertrophy. I assess risk and I, then I collaborate. And the, you know, the ENT and the pediatrician can make that diagnosis because they do the treatment, the ENTs do the treatment. So they do the diagnosis. This is what I see. I'm, seeing, I'm taking not full cone beams, but I'm doing, you know, this is, this is about one tenth the radiation of a bite wing when you do a scout. Um, and look at those adenoids on that kid. And nothing's gonna be done about this other than take out adenoids. When you take out adenoids, all you do is carve out the posterior wall of the nasopharynx. What about the anterior wall? McNamara and others have showed when you expand a child, this whole maxillary complex will come forward, especially if they have myofunctional therapy with it. This is a very important slide. I made this slide just for these, you know, these two AHS groups. Um, <clears throat> this is Steven Stern. He's an evolutionary biologist. His son uh, at Yale, his son is an ENT. He published this. Another reason that we've got to get in there and at least be adjunctive to TNA surgery, if not instead of, is that the adult morbidity that accompanies, that follows adenoidectomy is unbelievable. These are like millions of patients and I'll, I'll send anybody this study, um, but it's just another reason. We have to provide another solution than the so-called gold standard. Uh, also kids, the bleeding problems, the morbidity in, you know, in-house admissions, if your kids are younger than three from a TNA surgery. Uh, and then this is important, is that, sorry, I'm gonna buzz through this. I want another morbidity of so-called gold standard of what do you do for kids with apnea is put them on CPAP. Do you know what CPAP masks do to the mid face and pushes the, the whole maxillary complex and soft palate into the posterior pharynx? So you're saving their life. You must give them the CPAP, but wouldn't it be nice to prevent it or put them in reverse pole traction while you're doing it? This is what happens with expansion alone. You increase this whole, we, they call it the sagittal depth of the nasal pharynx. And Linda Aronson in Sweden, an orthodontist, showed that if this is over 20 by age eight and a half, this distance from here to the posterior nasal spine, and then from here to the posterior nasal spine, if this is over 15, and this is over 20, these kids have such good structure to be mouth, to be nose breathers. If it's less than that, they have a propensity for being uh, habitual mouth breathers. This is what we did with one kid um, who had a face mat, who had a CPAP. She had sickle cell, she almost died twice. Um, she was uh, 24 hospital admissions over two years for pulmonic crisis. Um, sorry, these lines should be over here where the adenoid is, but what we did and this is a paper that shows this is an un, unintended a consequence of CPAP, that it pushes the face in, it pushes the whole maxilla in, and this whole um, maxillary complex and uh, saw palate will be pushed into the posterior pharynx. So this is what we can do by expansion and protraction. Um, and we don't consider ourselves successful just because we see structural changes but we also see that we do pre and uh, progress treatment of assessing the child's sleep and breathing behaviors. This is a kid that completely in less than two years had all their sleep and breathing problems resolved. This isn't the same girl with the sickle cell, this is another one. Um, but here she is afterwards. Um, and you can see the difference is that this area here, if you know the law of laminar flow, if you uh, change the radius of a tube through which a liquid or gas flows, um, you inverse, 
uh, inversely, uh, inverse proportion will decrease resistance to the fourth power. So if you double the radius, you not only cut resistance in half, that would be a direct inverse proportional change, but one over two to the fourth power, one sixteenth. A soda straw turns into a fire hose. And this kid got off a CPAP and look at the front of her face. Look what we did. We helped bring that whole maxilla forward. Um, so who's to say, if we do this to a child and you know, this is another kid, we started her at four and a half, here she is. Um, I think it's reasonable to speculate that this kid will live longer than she would have otherwise, or at least um, live better, uh, live you know, into old age, that her health span will be improved. So that's it, that's all I got. Thank you for your time. Well, Sorry. That was, no, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. And maybe we'll just stop sharing the screen so we can have um, a discussion here. Terrific. So it is amazing what you can do, what you have done, Dr. Boyd. I mean, everyone knows or everyone doesn't know, they should know about the Connor Deegan story that really I, probably everybody on this call knows about it, but perhaps the medical professionals do not. How many uh, children like Connor Deegan have you treated? How many lives have you saved? Yeah, that, well, saving the life is something you can only conjecture, but in terms of improving quality of life, um, it's Orla has a list of parents that tell her, look, if you've got doubting Thomas parents like we were, please have them call me. And so it's it just in my staff, I've got a team that it, this is hard to do. This is a problem, Ben, maybe you can help me solve it. Is it, how do you integrate this into a busy, uh, you know, restorative practice, implant TMD practice? Cause this is all I do all day long. And I have a dream team. I have uh, dental assistants. One of them, two of them got into dental school. They're D1s this year. Uh, one of them, uh, Gigi is actually a physician who I gotta tell you, I'm not sure she still wants to be an OB gynae. Uh, she's, you know, I hope I'm not spilling the beans, but um, dental school is something that I'm hoping she will seriously consider because she would be a marvelous dentist, uh, you know, dual trained as a, who, how many MD, DDSs do you know that aren't oral surgeons? I mean, it's just not common. And she, you should, just all my staff, they're so wonderful with kids. They can get special needs kids to get a cone beam that get them to sit still for 4.8 seconds um, and get a retainer in, you know, a severely autistic child or, you know, cerebral palsy. It, it's just amazing what can be done if you have the right team. And these kids, I call them, my kids, uh, they are, they come to work and they love what they're doing. It's pretty amazing. You can see it. They know they're making a difference in the kids' lives. And so it's not just me and my partner, Janet, who's a general dentist who's been with me 20 years. Um, she is a better pediatric dentist than I am. And she's a better orthodontist than most, you know, any orthodontist or pediatric dentist that I've trained or worked with. I know a lot of great ones. Um, Lauren Ballinger from Massachusetts. Um, so I, I don't even know if they know about this. She's call. on the call right now. So oh, she, well, <laughs> she, she's, the only, she's the first pediatric dentist I ever met that says, we got to get rid of the demand for restorative. We got to get rid of cavities because it's getting in the way of us taking care of kids' airways. And we, she and I, and Steve Carsonson and uh, Barry Raphael, a couple other orthodontists, we started this Endeavor group. Uh, so you should have the Endeavor group come on too. Uh, AAPMD features us every Monday. Uh, it's a very elite group of orthodontists, pedodontists, general dentists, and myofunctional therapists. Uh, and Nestor's come on and talked. It's, it's really an amazing group. Uh, so, oh, good. So Lauren's here, I hope. So yeah. she's got some- She's been on, on our guest and she raves about you. So it's nice to see the mutual, uh, <laughs> the love here. And um, a lot of our questions have to do with just what we're talking about. And I don't, I know Dr. Morali, you're also successful in getting um, patients on board. You have um, a, a couple of tips or tricks that you use. Uh, yeah, you know, so mostly it's my entire team and the passion they have for helping the kids. So, you know, I, I started this a long time ago. And as a beginning, as a restorative dental practice, this fully transitioned to basically childhood growth and development. And now I, 
I have to turn people away for crowns and bridge and give them to associates and hire associates and, you know, let, let other dentists do that kind of work. I, I don't, I don't really get to do that anymore. Most of it is growth and development, early childhood. And then of course we see teens and adults also, but you know, the, the demand is tremendous. And so uh, I, I can't satisfy even the demand in my own community which is part of the reason I, I started teaching more is that other people have to pick this up and help out because I can't even satisfy my own town, let alone, you know, what else is going on everywhere. And so, you know, of course, with Dr. Boyd in the pediatric community, you know, this, this is his entire world. I had to swing out of restorative dentistry and happily did so. And my team also, you know, now we kind of grunt if we see a crown in the schedule, like who wants to make a crown anymore? You know, after you see what you can do with, growth and development and help a child sleep through the night and start helping these symptoms go away, you just don't feel like cutting a tooth again. And not that we don't need good dentists doing good crown and bridge work. Um, I don't, don't want to belittle it, but we certainly would rather see the children and the team looks forward to seeing those kids and, and the difference it makes is tremendous. And like Dr. Boyd said, the earlier, the better. Terrific. And there's a lot of questions. We have a lot of myofunctional therapists and speech pathologists on the call tonight, and they want to know the best way to explain to parents why they're referring to a dentist for early intervention, such as palatal expansion and not an orthodontist. My, my visceral response to that is of all of the physical traits that, you know, are comorbid with sleep and breathing disorders, like 30 of them are above the clavicles. So who, who's in that space more than we are? Uh, that is really the most common sense answer is that you, you have behavioral traits, you know, the snoring, the grinding, the bedwetting, the sweating, and you have physical traits, which are pretty much all reside above the neck. So I, I just, that's the one reason. Um, there's also uh, birth history traits. I mean, preterm birth, um, and uh, low birth weight, those are two things that will reliably predict that postnatally this child will have some sort of sleep disorder breathing, if not full blown apnea. So that's why it's, it's where we live. And, and it really only became separated at World War II. Physicians and dentists worked intimately. And I can send you a hundred articles from the late 19th century, all the way up through World War II. Please do. We're, 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 we're geeks that way. <laughs> good, good. We got them. And if you go to Journal of Clinical Sleep Medicine, 100 years, a century of failure of adenal tonsillectomy to so completely resolve um, sleep apnea. And I, I use six references that are over 100 years old. And I never thought they invited me to comment on it. And I thought I kind of trashed ENT a little bit that, you know, and I, I didn't mean to, it's just that, look, you have a collaborator, we're called dentists and we can work together. And they printed it and it's that we could, Orla will send it to you, Lauren, and you can Thank just you. send it out to everybody. <clears throat> okay. And also the same conversation with the pediatrician. So you're working very closely. You're saying you're lucky enough to have that relationships. Can you give some tips on how you built that? You know, I know that was pre pre ADA pamphlet that you helped show. So, how did you build those relationships to get them on board? Any 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 tips you have for our listeners? I I started out almost a full time academic. I thought that's what I wanted to do, and then I got embroiled in a faculty practice at the University of Chicago, and it was built by pediatricians at the University of Chicago. So, I was asked to do grand rounds, and um, so. I just started relying on pediatricians. I mean, they didn't know where to send anybody. And I just, that's how it started. And then when I left U of C and went in with other institutions part-time, I really realized that pediatricians don't have any clue that we do more than fill cavities. So I just thought, here's a way to let them know is to, even though I know who the best ENT is for a kid, because, you know, I, I, I'm a, a uh, consultant, you know, in the ENT and sleep medicine department. And, but I don't do that. I can make that direct referral. I call the pediatrician. They don't always, you just do it, Kev. I know you know everybody. But sometimes they'll say, well, I really like so-and-so. And all things being equal, then, okay, let's, let's, let's send them and see what happens. And 
they just like some pediatricians are just totally unaware. What I do is I put together a small PowerPoint. I show the ad noise from the lateral head film. I show the pediatric sleep questionnaire. You know, physicians, don't, they don't get this in their training any more than dentists do. So I kind of know what they don't know. And then not judge them, but just say, look, let's work together for the benefit of this kid. I have a letter, a form letter that Orla will send you and you can put it on your own letterhead, dear primary care physician. Uh, you mm -hmm. know, and, and that's how you do it. That's, that's what I suggest. Well, we'll take you up on that offer as well and send that out to everyone email. I know Dr. Marley, you had the same experience. Uh, you were doing ground rounds, right? For the pediatric community in your ho local hospital, correct? Yeah, it, it started out um, as just a lunch and learn. You know, I asked our local pediatrician, uh, the office, do you do lunch and learn in here? And, you know, of course, guessing they probably do of some sort. And um, I, they said, yes. So I, I went and I got myself a screen. I got a projector. It was the first time I got a projector and a screen, put it all together. I set it up in one of their operatories. I brought in a lunch and a snack. I threw it on the counter to keep them interested because I, I, they didn't know what they were going to see. And I think they might not have been interested in seeing anything from a dentist. So I figured if I get some good food on the counter, they might stay in there longer. So I totally tricked them into sitting there. And next thing you know, I was showing these kids between three and 11. And uh, the response was, was pretty powerful because what I learned right there in that first visit was that they, they, didn't, they, don't, they don't know much about the mouth or the growth and development of the jaws. But what they did know was that something was wrong with the child right here. And unfortunately what happened and what I learned was they were conditioned by the ortho specialty at the time. So in my community, anytime a pediatric, anytime a pediatrician sent a child that was younger than 11 to the orthodontic office, they got a letter back or a call that said, it's young, it's too young, you send them to us at 11. And so they were conditioned from the beginning to send at 11. And I was showing them between three and 11, look what you can do to help these children. And then the light bulb went off. And so from there, they started sending those kids to me. And from that, it led to a grand rounds. I was doing a quarterly grand rounds at eight o'clock on Tuesday morning to 30 pediatricians showing them case after case after case of what you could do to a three to 10 years old. And then that grew, I mean, that's 15 years ago, but that has grown immensely since then, which is why I'm teaching it elsewhere and recruiting with Dr. Boyd to get, we need more people doing it to help out more kids. Yeah, you know, we can't do it alone. Yeah, Dr. So, Boyd. Could, could I ask a question here? Um, yeah. There's a number of people are wondering how they can be be a part of the Endeavor Group, and um, it's not yet a organization that you can join. But can you patch in Lauren for a couple of minutes because she co-founded it with me and uh, Steve Carsonson and Bill Hang and. Um, I don't know because she's not a panelist, but oh. Dr. Um, Howie Hinton is going to be joining us at nine o'clock for some a APMD updates. So perhaps oh, he can you. shed some light on that. But I know we had her as a guest and we did speak about Endeavor, maybe not um, that's archived. Uh, if you want to find out more about that, or we can have you guys back on and have an Endeavor call with Airway Health Solutions if you want. Well, for now, it's not open <laughs> for membership. It's just what it is a, is a consortium and we're putting together, you know, goals and, and eventually it will be something that people can be part of. We just, we're not there yet. We're, we're intentionally keeping it to about, I think 16 or 18 people. And that's the way it's been for a year and a half. So, but I think Dr. Yeah. Ballinger, I just gave you permission to talk. If you want to chime in, I don't know if you can have your video, but maybe we can get you, uh, if you're, Oh, yeah, hi. There you go. Hi. hi. I don't want to take too much time away from all these amazing people. Um, I just was starting to type in my um, email, but yes, uh, everybody is sort of part of the endeavor. It's made for everybody. And it's, you know, our ultimate goal is just what all three of you were talking about is to try to meet the demand um, of this incredible need that there's not enough providers out there to um, meet the demand of the parents, moms, and children that we need to. I think Ben said it so well that, you know, we're getting to the point that we can't even meet the need in our own communities and our offices. So um, really what the Endeavor is working to do, and this is why we're not quite open to other members yet, is that we're just really a think tank of how to best organize and include all the different training programs that are available, part of it, what we're trying to do, like what you guys are doing and 
others um, to really consolidate and make that information easily accessible so that other dentists can really get in and learn technique um, that they can start using in their practices um, above and beyond just knowledge of screening. Because I think that although screening is incredibly important, that there have to be enough hands-on providers that are able to um, do the structural therapy that's needed um, as early as possible. So bottom line, Endeavor is free and open to all in terms of information sharing. There are free hour webinars once a month on the AAPMD uh, platform. And uh, soon, you know, to be a very inclusive um, place to find training and information for all those that actually want to start getting their hands uh, wet, <laughs> quote unquote, wet on very young kids. So um, I don't want to take up any more of Kevin or Ben or your time, Lauren, but um, it's very exciting. And I just think it's so awesome to even be a participant listening to the three of you. This is just amazing how far it's come in my short journey over the last uh, seven years. So thank yeah, you. And again, thank you for joining. And you had your whole podcast just on you. So go to our archives and you can get a lot of information um, from Dr. Lauren Ballinger is airway basically every day, right? That's what you're doing. Well, so. yeah, I mean, if anyone, I mean, I'd really be happy to share, especially my journey um, similar to Ben and Kevin about getting to the point where I eliminated doing restorative dentistry, hospital dentistry, and um, sort of general, quote unquote, general pediatric dentistry. And this is all I focus on. And, um, you know, I heard a lot of it can't be done. And that's just not true. I think all of us can do whatever we want to do, whatever we manifest and whatever comes from our hearts, it can absolutely be done. So um, go for it. If it's something you envision, and you want to do in your practice, I highly recommend um, to do it. And it's more than possible and incredibly satisfying. Thank we you so much. And it, it, this, this is going to be like seat belts and penicillin. This is going to be big. This is going to be worldwide, but it's got to start out like a tropical depression turning into a hurricane. Uh, and, and I think we're up to about a, maybe a level, not, not quite a hurricane, but we're gathering steam in uh, Endeavor and AHS, all these things working together. Um, so it, it really, it, it, it not only, it must be big, it must become big. Well, Dr. Boyd, you were sharing before we went live how last week, we were supposed to be on last week as everyone knows, but you were um, with uh, James Nestor and the BBC has a podcast that you're both on. Maybe you could talk a little bit about that and just how this is now becoming a hot topic. So it's probably easier, I would think, to talk to pediatricians about it because they may be hearing it, you know, in, in the background somewhere. Yeah, I think... Um... Nestor's book, if, you, if you've not read his book, James Nestor, it's called Breath, Not Breathe, Breath. And a lot of us in Endeavor members and really people, uh, Mariana Evans at, at Penn, she's somebody you should look up. Um, <laughs> we were consultants for that book. And now it's in 32 languages. It's been on the New York Times bestseller list for four or five months now. And it just has drawn so much attention from the lay public and, and professional healthcare professional community about the importance of recognizing these problems early um, and the, the potential for, for devastation uh, of, of the quality and quantity of life of children. So um, we were interviewed. He now from time to time will call me or Bill Hang or probably you know, Lauren will probably get a call from him because he came on Endeavor and he knows all of us. And he likes to do interviews um, and he interviews me. And um, the BBC, um, it's, a, it's a real big podcast in the UK that they have. And um, they invited James and James invited me and the local PBS station sent over some people and they did it, you know, right from where I'm sitting now. And uh, he was on there and they were, they were in England. So that's going to be on, um, I think, within a month. So Wonderful. we'll give you a, a link to it when it comes yeah, out. And I'll, I'll be sure to share that. So that's, that's really exciting. So we have a lot of questions, but a lot of these questions are technique 
questions. So we're gonna kind of skip over that because that's why we develop full day courses. Um, I wish we could just give a simple answer to a lot of these complex questions. But Lauren, a lot of- was One yes. question I saw that was technique related, but asked sure. in such a way that, because I don't like answering technique because people right. want to know what can I do on Monday and you know. Right. That's fine, I, I understand that. The question was, how wide um, does the palate have to be before you actually affect nasorespiratory, you know, resistance? Like how, you know, what, what is the expansion millimeters? Well, it isn't that it, it's not an absolute number because you can get an intermolar width by tipping teeth. It has to be truly orthopedic expansion. First, unwarping the alveolus and then, you know, stretching the mid palatal suture in the maxilla. In the mandible, it's just unwarping the alveolus. There's no suture down there. And a lot of people get caught, oh, there's no suture down there. You can't expand the mandible. BS, of course you can. You just unwarp the alveolus. And it, it, those are things that you would learn in a techniques course and we're developing one. So stay tuned. <laughs> exactly, stay tuned. Um, what would you say would be the best screening tool if you had to choose one for sleep disordered breathing? Both of you can answer that, please. Pediatric sleep questionnaire on for me and the, and the one that we're developing that won't be ready for two years. We're doing a validation study at the ADA now, but it's it's really based upon the pediatric sleep questionnaire. You just hit PSQ, pediatric sleep questionnaire, Ron Shervin, C-H-E-R-B-I-N, University of Michigan, and you'll get a link and you can download a license. It's free and you get access to everything there. And we I have a shortened truncated version of it that I'd be happy to share and you just put your own letterhead on it. Um, again, call my office or uh, Lauren, you and Orla, just put sure, it I can, I can, all this information I will share with our listeners. Great. So. But what do you use, Ben? How do you screen? Like, Yeah, it would be ditto because the pediatric sleep questionnaire, you get the most information from the parents and it's the whole history of the child. So you meet, the, doesn't matter what age you met the child at, when they're filling out those forms, you're learning about the entire history of that child and it, it becomes their medical history. It becomes their medical symptom list. And so all of the things that are on that questionnaire are gonna lean right towards you have an underdeveloped set of jaws. And so that, that questionnaire gives me the most information. And then of course you take a full set of records, but you learn the most about the child from talking to the parents and having them fill in that form. In most physicians, pediatricians do not get this in their fellowship training. They do not get it in medical school any more than Ben and I got it in dental school or I got it in my oh. people residency. We didn't learn any of this stuff. So it's, no. our, it's our responsibility to share this with our medical colleagues and our dental colleagues. A lot of questions um, are around myofunctional therapy and how do you incorporate that? And also for um, tongue tie releases, is it a necessity pre and post? Take it away, Ben. <laughs> yeah, so the if you backtrack about 17 years ago, I would have given the answer, what is a tongue tie? <laughs> Did I I spent four years in dental school? I'm not sure I know what a tongue tie is after that. So then you fast forward to today where I recognize most kids have restricted tissues that need to be released. And so between the lingual frenum, the labial frenum, and the four buckle frenum. So you, you count those up and there you have six right there. And it turns out most kids need some release. So when you're looking at even mild restriction, the mild restrictions have uh, an effect on the growth and development. And so you have the, the risk factor being a lack of growth and development of the jaws. And then the lack of growth and development on the jaws is a risk factor for sleep disorder breathing. So there's a direct connection from the tethered oral tissues or restricted frenum to sleep disorder breathing. And um, you know, one, of, one of the helpful little books that we use to help educate parents is by Dr. Lawrence Kotlow. It's the SOS for Tots book. I find that very helpful. It's a quick read. It's great for anyone in the dental team. And also you can share that with parents so in an hour or two, they can, can start learning too. So the, yeah, the frenum, certainly now it's most kids need them revised. Myofunctional therapy is a necessity. You know, I could backtrack 18 years ago. What is myofunctional therapy? I never heard of that in dental school. Didn't hear about it for the first 10 years of practice. And then the, the years go by and then you realize, oh my goodness, it turns out that the myofunctional therapy is probably one of the most significant components of treating a child because you have a lot of soft tissue dysfunction in there. And while we have appliances and techniques and great stuff as part of the therapy, some of it has to be focused on the actual cause. 
And if we've got this early soft diet delivering soft tissue dysfunction, then we should work on the soft tissue dysfunction as well. So it turns out at this point, I understand most kids need their frenums attended to, and most kids need a myofunctional therapist as part of the program in order to get the best results. So if you could only do one part of the treatment, you get limited results. If you can incorporate it all, you get a real miraculous change in the child's overall health and well-being. And like Dr. Boyd was saying, you know, their health span. And then in the end, you know, you're looking to have an effect on their entire health span, not just did you fit 28 teeth in, which really the goal should be 32, because if you do develop the jaws fully from early on, you should expect to have 32 teeth. So the myofunctional therapy is, is a huge piece of the puzzle. Every child that is diagnosed with a malocclusion should probably have a myofunctional therapist working with them. Yeah, I, I pretty much now recommend every single patient that comes in the door that they get pre-treatment or, or early on in treatment, myofunctional evaluation. A good paper for everybody here, and what I'm so glad to hear Ben say dysfunction, is that all pretty much 100%, because there was no malocclusion before industry, so that supports what I'm about to say, is that if, if a child has a malocclusion that isn't related to a genetic syndrome, it's a result of orofacial myofacial dysfunction. OMD, Linda D'Onofrio, I'll send you the paper, but that's where all malocclusion comes from. So it just stands to reason. You can prevent it by you know, recognizing myo dysfunction and you can reverse it by resolving the myo dysfunction. I, it, it just, it is so sensible. Um, Linda D'Onofrio, D capital O-N-O-F-R-I-O. -O -O. Yes, she was gonna be on this call too. So she's actually done that. She has the recording link. So um, she's wonderful. And we can get you that oh, information. She'll write in and tell me how bad my posture is. She did <laughs> well, I'm looking to see if, yeah. she's on, if she's on now, but she's wonderful and um, has a wonderful Facebook group that many of you I'm sure are part of. Um, I can include that in the follow-up as well. There's also a coffee clutch. I don't know if you know um, Samantha Weaver. Um, she's a myofunctional therapist mm -hmm. in, in LA. And she, on Saturday morning, she has this thing called Coffee Clutch, and it is so good. So Wonderful. anyway, I'll send you up <laughs> that too. Wonderful. So let's get back to that genetic piece, because I had a lot of questions on that, especially with the airway. So I've been, I've been hearing that people have a collapsed airway, and that's genetic. Can, can you touch upon that? <laughs> Everything's genetic because we have genes, that, and that's always my answer. Mm -hmm. You know, the genes have to be told what to do by the environment. Right, Ben? I yeah. Mean, epigenetic. I mean, epigenetic is the right word for it. There's like laryngeal malacia and things that are more genetic than, than environmental, but you know, that's silly. I, it's a, in this day and age from what has been done with the human genome project to call something, you know, one gene produces one trait. I mean, there's a sickle cell is caused by one gene. Hunting, Huntington's disease is caused by one gene. Do you know how many diseases work that way? Almost none. <laughs> positions, but you change the environment, you know, so that, that's all I can say about it. There's a, there's a lot that's not known, but to think that genes just unfold, that, that is just doesn't make sense in light of what we know about the human genome. You know, yeah. Genome. And you have a, the, the whole world of anthropology research into malocclusion through the likes of Dr. Corcini, Dr. Jerome Rose, not only do they collaborate with the genetic community, but they learn from them as well. And then Dr. Corcini had an entire focus on the identical twin aspect of things, how their jaws can grow completely different if you have a different environment. So you, you have a whole bunch there and not to mention the hard soft diet studies. You can make identical twins grow differently just by altering the diet. So yeah, malocclusion is not in the genes. It just became a loose and easy answer to say because if a child looks a certain way like their jaws are underdeveloped and you have crowded teeth, well, if a parent had the crowded teeth or the grandparent had the crowded teeth, the problem with the kids is that we're seventh generation post-industrial living. So of course the parents have it and the grandparents have it. At the grandparent rate, it's still 85 or better percentage. So you have an easy way to say, oh, if your parent had it or your grandparent had it, you got six people to choose from right there. So it must be in the genes. But just because a child or parent or grandparent has a trait doesn't make it genetic. It can be from the environment. And there are plenty of examples of that. So the, the faster the dental community understands that this is an acquired condition, thanks to industrial Western uh, uh, and change of the soft diet, 
then you get to the point where you can treat it through the cause and not get trapped into just saying it's in your genes. It's not, I, it's not a genetic condition. An, another um, thing I think for some of you, when you do this and you get challenged by whomever, um, you, you just make the analogy between myopia, nearsightedness. If a, you see lots of three-year-olds in glasses now, right? Would it be mm -hmm. sensible? How would you like to go to a pediatrician who told you, you know what, your kid has severe myopia. Why don't we let it get worse? Maybe till they go almost blind and give them glasses so that they can pass a driving test. And it's a really good analogy. You wouldn't, you, you just wouldn't think of that. You correct it when you see it or you might get brain damage. And that's what happens with, you know, farsightedness, nearsightedness, astigmatism, uh, amblyopia, lazy eye. All those, they call them um, uncorrected uh, refractive errors. If they aren't dealt with in early childhood, they will cause lots of morbidity later on. And malocclusion is the same way. It's a great sound analogy. Use it, please. Excellent. Great advice. Um, as far as getting the pediatricians on board with earlier recommendations to get an orthodontic screening, do you have any luck with that, Dr. Boyd? Do you get referrals from pediatricians at this point? I, I do. I, I mean, it, it doesn't mean that they come. Well, I asked um, our assistant, uh, Orla's assistant office manager, when Orla wasn't in yet, because I had just been away, I said, what are our three largest referral sources? And, you know, the top three were just a consortium of different myofunctional therapists that understand how our work relates to, to the other. The other was Nestor's textbook. <laughs> they call it Nestor's book referral. And a, pedi a, a large pediatric practice, uh, medical practice, that was started by uh, Mark Weisbluth, who wrote the first book on pediatric sleep back in the 70s. They call him the sleep Nazi and his son now runs that practice and they just send us loads of patients. So um, I don't know, you know, yeah, it's, but I, you know, I've been practicing 32 years. It, 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 hopefully it'll start faster for you guys if you're doing this early on. Absolutely. And you have more support and resources. I know um, Dr. Howie Hinden was going to try to come on at nine o'clock. I'm trying to um, hold on here because I like to be mindful of people's times, but I'm going to give him a few more minutes and then ask maybe a couple more questions or um, then go to some updates because a lot of the questions are about, well, what are next steps? Like, how can we do this? How can we integrate this? So I do want to go ahead and um, share my screen so you have some resources from AHS and I will follow up with the wonderful resources, um, Dr. Boyd, that you are sharing all night long. So let me just go ahead and share my screen here. I, but, I would tell everybody to do validated screening, do the pediatric sleep questionnaire, put it into your medical history right now. You know, if you're gonna be seeing kids, you must put this into your health history. Uh, it just, that's, that is, now what do you do? You know what, do that first. Identify to the parents. And then look for resources and, you know, call Lauren, call, call my office and we'll, we'll do our best to, to try to find somebody uh, what to do next. But screen, screen, screen. That's the first thing. That's definitely the first thing. And we review that in our mini residency. And I know, um, Dr. Boyd, you kind of spilled the beans that we'll be partnering together in the near future, which I'm so excited about. Um, but I, it's not a formal announcement yet, but stay tuned, especially maybe for Q4 or Q1 of 2022, where we will be uh, teaming together to provide more resources because um, we need to collaborate just as we are collaborating with all of our other colleagues. So we're really excited to bring new courses. Um, but meanwhile, we have our pediatric mini residency with Dr. Ben Moralia um, coming up September 10th is the pediatric and September 17th is the adult. We do have um, an advanced mini residency coming up also where Dr. Moralia is gonna be talking about fixed expansion um, uh, in appliances for ortho and teens, as well as um, uh, Dr. Mal, you want to chime in a little bit on on this course? I know we're so excited. You can just unmute. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. You know, it's wonderful if we meet the kids between three and 10, but that doesn't always happen. And sometimes the children do walk in at 12 or 14 or 15, and they're in two categories. They've either been treated with uh, retractive or maybe extractive orthodontics, 
or they haven't been treated. And so they're very underdeveloped. And if not, you know, they're in a bad place and they still need attention. And so from 12 to 17, there's a window of opportunity where you can still use expansive techniques. And we're also going to introduce a bracket and wire technique that is also expansive and a wider and forward growing technique there to help out. So we have um, a lot of opportunity to help the teens who have either been treated maybe in a retractive fashion or have missed treatment and altogether still need help with their growth and development. Because like Dr. Boyd pointed out, you, you don't outgrow any of this. Uh, any, any child that has an underdeveloped set of jaws, it doesn't go away on its own. They do not spontaneously grow to full jaw development. So we have to help them at whatever age we meet them. So this course is designed to help in the teen category. Great, and Dr. Boyd, do you wanna discuss any courses you have coming up? Yeah, we've developed uh... Dr. Darius Logmani is head of sleep medicine. Uh, we met first at uh, Children's Memorial Hospital that became Leary, um, and he got recruited by really the largest network of pediatric sleep labs in the state of Illinois, and it's now spilling over into Wisconsin and Michigan. Um, and he is just somebody, I cannot tell you, he says to me, Almost every day, I don't know how I got along without dentistry. I really, and we, I've never been treated that way by, you know, there, there's been Dr. Stephen Sheldon, really, he had me co-write chapters with him and books and we spoke together. But Darius is, like Manny, um, he wants to teach other people how to think about these problems. He's in charge of almost 200,000 children and all these networks. He can't see them all. He needs to increase the workforce and he feels it's not gonna come through medicine. It's gonna come through dentistry. And I think it's gonna be general dentists. I, I mean, I, Lauren and I and, and, and Lori and Carla Damon and uh, there, there's other pediatric dentists that are doing this, but it's gonna be child and airway focused general dentists. My partner of 20 years is a general dentist. And she is unbelievable what she does with kids. So we want to train more people. Um, it's going to be a three level course. Um, and we just finished, we're finishing up our first session. Um, and it's five general dentists and I think two pediatric dentists. Can't wait to get some orthodontists in there at some point. But we'll, we'll tell you about it. We, I mean, we're, we're sort of staying local now and uh, we have... Uh, workshop where you can come into the office and I help you treat your own patients. I don't know, we probably would come to you. Tyson Corner, that sounds, I mean, if you've got, uh, we would like to set up a teaching facility, you know, near something that what you guys are doing in addition to collaborating, you know, with the AHS, um, we would like to really show you how we do these, these mutual learning networks, we call them. Uh, well we're excited <laughs> for sure. Um, we also offer um, a two day myofunctional therapy course with Brittany Sierra and Carice Laguerre. And this course is a little bit different because we focus specifically on hygienists in your practice doing myo in your practice. So we're not teaching hygienists to open up their own myofunctional therapy practice. What we're doing is hands-on in your practice. So we do have a course that offers that. Please visit our website and I will give you some more follow-up information. Our next course is uh, November, when is that? Uh, 5th and 12th. <laughs> so that's really um, important. Anyone who's doing clear aligners, which I know a lot of our listeners, they're doing a lot of clear aligners. We actually um, started a new company called Clear Aligner University. Uh, Dr. Morali and I partnered together to just focus solely on clear aligner integration and getting your team on board. So we're gonna kick this off in sunny Florida on October 16th. It is a live course, um, it will be running. So um, if you want more information on that, please visit our website and you do have a uh, special code AHS150 for $150 off. And um, we also have our airway dentist locator. So Dr. Boyd, I'm gonna need to add you on here as, as an honorary airway dentist. Um, but we are so thrilled because this has actually grown um, quite a bit since we last posted this, but you know, over 200 doctors, we just started this a couple of years ago. And what's so exciting about this is you can find doctors in your area, maybe that you wanna collaborate with. Am I a functional therapist? Please, please use this as mutual reference points and, um, and, and resources. 
to collaborate and, and we can help you find new patients as well because we're constantly being asked, how can I find an airway dentist? So after taking our course, we'll get you on the map. Here is the um, what like the the golden ticket, right, Dr. Boyd? Yeah. This is what you're saying. It's not so much educating the pediatricians; it's just this ADACL. You want to talk a little bit more about that while we're waiting for Howie? Yeah, it it took us three years. Um, Steve Carsonson uh, from Seattle assembled the uh, Airway Health Task Force at the ADA, um, and Lauren Ballinger has is on the faculty now. And we've had three meetings, a fourth is coming up. Um, but I'm on this screening task force um, with uh, Jerry Simmons, who is a neurologist, uh, ped pediatric and adult neurologist in uh, Houston, I believe, who is, leads this task force. And it's just a star studied cast. And um, we came up with these, this questionnaire and it's, it's a short form um, of five questions that very similar to the PSQ. And then it has an expanded version. If you answer one of those questions, uh, then you go to the long form. And so now it's under, we're trying to raise funding to do a big validation study. That's probably gonna take about two years that we're gonna get um, overnight sleep studies on kids who um, answer a certain number of questions uh, positive on it. So. Wonderful. Please send away. You can get this. You can order these from the ADA and just hand them to your referral sources, to your parents. And um, anyone, I'm just going to jump to this slide quick, uh, not this one. Hold on. <laughs> anyone who's uh, been on our podcast before, on our, you can register here on our conversations, but you can also go in and see our archived podcast. So we do have Dr. Gerald Simmons, we do have Dr. Steve Carstensen, and they offer each a wealth of information. Um, so please make sure you do that. But we do have some upcoming Airway Health Solutions conversations. Uh, September, our own Dr. Ben Rai is going to be doing a two-hour study club on sleep disorder breathing. These are going to be all cases from childhood to adulthood. So please join us for that. I'm working on CE for that one. I'll keep you posted. Uh, Dr. Dania Tanimi, she'll be doing the understanding the airway through CBCT imaging. And then Dr. Jasmine Elmore on the upper respiratory resistance syndrome. So please mark those in your calendar. You can register early so you don't forget. And uh, I know Dr. Um, Hinda was gonna join us, but it looks like he's been caught up. So we are proud to be sponsors of the AAPMD. I know Dr. Morali is on the board. Um, so we do hope that you join this meeting because it's, it's really the best place to collaborate. You know, it's not just dental, it's medical and dental. And AOSH is actually at this meeting as well. So you'll have like-minded colleagues with a, a stellar um, lineup. So please check out their website. Uh, and see if you want to register. You can have a code of $100 off CC100. And I guess we missed Howie, but that's going to do it for us. I know we went over and I apologize, but I feel like we could talk for another hour <laughs> just answering all these questions. Um, Dr. Boyd, thank you so much for your wisdom and your passion and all you do and for the resources that you're gonna share with us. I'll be sure to pass that along. Dr. Moralia, as always, it's a pleasure and thank you so much for your passion and your time and um, so much that you give to help general dentists like you really become airway specialist for lack of a better word. So thank you both for moving this profession forward in such a way that you're truly saving I think saving children's lives every day. So God bless both of you. Thank you everyone for joining us and um, stay tuned from exciting news of a future collaboration with AHS and Dr. Boyd. Thanks for we'll putting it, it together. Lauren. You did a great job. That was Thank beautiful. you, it's my pleasure. Thank you everyone, good night. Thank you everyone, good night. Thank you, Kevin, that was awesome.